and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dan Conley, who's a professor of quaternary sciences at Lund University. Um, Dan investigates the biogeochemical cycles of nutrients, especially silica, and the linkages between the Earth's surface and aquatic ecosystems. Um, he studies all that silica that comes out of land surfaces, whether it's phytoliths or diatoms or weathering of minerals and how that makes it into the oceans. Um, he's interested in long-term trends driven by climate and nutrients and how ecosystems respond to changes in the drivers. Um, he uses paleoecological techniques and analysis of long-term monitoring data to help manage aquatic systems. He's done a lot of work on declining oxygen, um, particularly in the Baltic Sea, and has been well recognized for some really important work. And Dan has also is also the co-author on this book called Silica Stories, which starts with sections on silicon, silica, silicic acid, silicate, and silicone. There's only one small section on diatoms, and it ends with uh, uh, silica saves the day. So um, thank you for all your work, Dan, and um, thank you for speaking with us today. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here um, and tell you about the most important element in the world, silica. But I guess you already are expecting that I would say that. Um, I guess I want to start by saying that this work is being done with a lot of collaborators. Um, it's uh, and a lot of people have uh, contributed to this. And uh, at the very end, I'll have a list of names of people, both from my group and people that I work from from other universities as well. And I've been very lucky. This work is funded by two grants, one by Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. Uh, they're a Swedish organization, and uh, it's a five-year grant that's ending this year. And I also have an advanced grant from the European Research Council. And I have another couple years left on that grant to work on this. And it's to work on the role of diatoms and how they're affecting the global biogeochemical cycle of silica, but also how other silicifiers are affecting the oceans as well. But today, most of it will be focused on the diatoms. And as you know, diatoms are these gorgeous organisms. Uh, and I like them because they're great carriers for silicon dioxide. And, uh, and I don't look at them. I usually uh, put them in a base and dissolve them and then measure them for either their silica content or for their silica stable isotopes or, or nutrient content as well. But I work on other organisms as well. On the bottom left here, you see radiolarians. We also measure isotopic content of those. Uh, in the middle is a, a sponge spicules of different types. And we use this uh, small skinny one uh, in the middle uh, that's labeled C. And then I also work on new clay mineral formation. And this is uh, silica being deposited uh, on the face of a, a diatom frustral. I like diatoms because they do a variety of different things. Uh, they have incredible genetic variation that allow diatoms that are living together in a community to use the same resource, but in slightly different ways. And uh, it makes them very competitive, uh, taking up nutrients, whether it's nitrogen, phosphorus, or silica, or whatever. Um, they account for 40% of marine productivity that's exported to debt. And that's, of course, important for the global carbon cycle and for climate. And as Henry Bigelow said, he's a famous American oceanographer, is all fish as diatoms. And then finally, 
for me, it's also the dominant organism controlling dissolved silicate concentrations in today's oceans. Uh, they bring dissolved silicate concentrations down very low through vast areas of the ocean. And that hasn't always been the case. And one of the reasons they're able to do this, they have this amazing silica transporter system, this diatom sit. And there's other organisms that have uh, these others called sit L, and there are five uh, transmembrane uh, that take silica from outside the cell and bring it into the cell. Uh, plants also have one have sit LSI2s, but somewhere along the way, when diatoms evolved, uh, they uh, two of these five membranes were fused together and formed a 10 transmembrane uh, transporter. And it's extremely efficient. It's much more efficient than any other organism in taking up that silica. Um, the thing is about uh, these transporters, they do other things too. Uh, some of them are probably um, uh, participate in bone formation, and some of them probably transport phosphorus as well. Uh, and so they're they're really important, though. The most important is for the silica part of it. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to give you some background from my perspective about the evolution of diatoms and uh, where we are and where we would like to go, but we're not there. Um, the second part will be a little bit about ocean dissolved silicate concentrations through geologic time that are largely due to changes in, in diatoms. And uh, finally, I'll talk about silica cycling and biosilification in the oceans. So this is one of my favorite graphs. It was from a guy named Raymond Sievert. He was a, um, a geologist at Harvard, and he was the first one to really put together this hypothesis about how dissolved silicate has changed throughout geologic time. And in the early part of the record, um, before the Phanerozoic, dissolved silicate concentrations were supposedly high and close to saturation. And then sometime in the Edicarian Cambrian boundary, uh, from 580 to 540 million years ago, two different organisms evolved, uh, the sponges and the radiolarians, and they dropped silica, dissolved silicate concentrations to a lower level. But it was really the diatoms, um, and at least in this picture, it's at the start of the Eocene, uh, or start of the Cenozoic, uh, 66 million years ago, when diatoms expanded and uh, decreased dissolved silicate concentrations in the oceans. But my question is really, when did diatoms evolve? Um, you have a whole variety of different ways of looking at that, whether through fossils or through genomics. And uh, I don't necessarily believe that it was 60 million years ago or even 30 million years ago. So I'll give you a little background about how uh, this has changed through time and I think where we are today. And so this was, I would say, uh, what was believed up until the uh, 2000, as late as 2015 and 16. Uh, I haven't seen so many papers about this after that, but this was mainly from ODP data, Ocean Drilling Project. They put an NSF grant together and uh, they put together all the diatoms that they could find in the Ocean Drilling Program. And they made this curve, the green curve, that's the normalized diversity. And you can see these big changes in diversity. Um, this work by Sermeno also made estimates about the dissolved silicate flux to the ocean, which is in the blue. And it was based on strontium isotopes. And they made some uh, calculations 
on how much strontium and how much weathering uh, would be in the oceans. I don't necessarily agree with what their calculations were, but you can see that it has some relationship to the, to the diversity. Um, this was fairly carried on by Andy Knoll and Nick Fallas. And this is in one way, a really fantastic paper. Uh, but what they did was they prescribed what happened with diatoms and dinoflagellates and coccolithophores. And, uh, and they looked at the radiation of these phytoplankton using trace-based models and how it affected the, uh, the biology of the oceans. And diatoms are really important for that because of all the things I talked about in the beginning and that they're great carbon sources for other organisms, that they, uh, they do lots of different things. But again, this was from diatom data uh, from the early days, I would say. And I, I don't think people were as interested in what had happened in the past. And then they gave that database uh, up in the Natural History Museum in Berlin took it on. Uh, and David Lazarus and uh, John Rinaldi are, have worked on it and they have put much more data into it. But again, it's primarily focused on the Cenozoic. So things that happen from 66 million years uh, to present. And the interesting thing you can see at the very start of this graph at the bottom is how important Cretaceous taxa were. And I think that people haven't really paid attention to Cretaceous taxa for a variety of different reasons. And so that was one of the things we're trying to do in the projects that I have. And this is a, a, a figure from Carolyn Brinkler. She's a PhD student in my group, and we're putting together all the data for diatoms that happened in the Cretaceous. And uh, this was an earlier figure, and I think we're up to something like over 500 species. Um, most of those species are from, uh, uh, from closer to the Cenozoic, uh, but the oldest diatom species that we can find in the fossil record are only 125 million years ago. And, uh, and there were actually very few records of diatoms uh, compared to what they are in, in the modern oceans. And I'll get to that talk in a moment. And so what we were really interested in looking at is trying to fill out the record and uh, and come up with using, by looking at fossils, when did diatoms evolved? And as I mentioned, I think the first reference for uh, fossils uh, are, of the oldest fossils are from 125 million years ago. Uh, the pictures that I'm showing you there is actually from 120 million years ago from data from the Weddell Sea. And I'm using these diatoms because they're prettier than the other publication I have that has the ones from 125 million years. But um, there are very few records of diatoms before that. And I'll, I'll talk about why and uh, what some of the problems are. Uh, on the figure on the right are diatoms supposedly from 180 million years ago uh, by a guy named Rothblitz uh, in Germany. And it actually, if you read his paper, it's from 190 million years ago. But the, uh, the way that we look at formations have changed. So the formations are actually 10 years younger. And the two uh, pictures are, are a picture of, of a diatom called Stephanopixis. Uh, which is a common marine diatom. And you can see they're very distinctive and they have spines on them. And he found this diatom, presumed diatom on the right and, uh, and called it Pixidicula. And, uh, 
And so what we were interested in doing in this project was uh, we had barked on a mission to verify whether Rothfuss was correct. There were some people that had questioned whether it was correct or not, and to discover, uh, are there older diatoms? And so what we did was we looked at probably over um, somewhere between 50 and 60 different sites around the globe. Um, we have looked at over 500 samples as well, uh, trying to find uh, diatoms in the geologic record that are, are, are older than the oldest diatoms previously found. Um, so first, and regarding the uh, Rothplatz samples, so we went back to the original place where he had, where they were collected. And, uh, and we collected a number of samples from each of the formations to try and find uh, if diatoms were actually there. And so the first one was up top is the, uh, from 19, 1896. And you see this uh, pretty little supposed diatom there. When we looked in our samples, we could find no diatoms at all. But we found this other calcareous nanofossil, um, schizophrenia. Um, and we just think that he misidentified that as a pixidicula. The uh, strange thing is, uh, if you look at the old diatom literature and you look at the testate amoeba literature, Pixidicula is used for several different organisms uh, in both uh, literatures. And, uh, and it had also been used for other things. So I suggest that Pixidicula is actually a, a garbage dump of different things where they have put people uh, organisms in. Uh, on the second uh, level is this other uh, supposed diatom from the 1900s. And, uh, and we looked closely and we found a number of these. We're using somebody else's photo because it was much better than the photos we had, but it was actually a teste amoeba and was not a, a diatom. Uh, the other interesting thing is this um, was came from unreliable material. It was a rock that someone brought from him from a cliff face where they were mining. Uh, they were mining uh, the, the rock from that cliff face and uh, the soils. And uh, it, it, they brought the rock to him and so the, there's really not a providence where it came from uh, along that cliff face. And uh, so from our perspective, uh, there are many other studies that have reliable, unreliable material. And so I think we can discount uh, both of these uh, pixidiculas as being diatoms. But uh, through our studies of looking at all these different locations, um, there we've learned a couple things. And uh, I think one of the things we learned was uh, we look at things under the light microscope and then we always take them to the SEM because we can do elemental analysis on the SEM. And you can see in this picture on the uh, left, it's a diatom-like structure. It actually was a green, has been identified as a green algae by a colleague. And when we do the elemental analysis, it turns out that it's made of carbon and oxygen, which clearly is organic matter and it's not made of silica. And so that using the SEM and the ability to look at the elemental composition has been really important for us in trying to decide uh, is this really a diatom or is it another organism? Uh, there's also been pieces of pollen that look like di pieces of diatoms as well. Um, the other thing was we struggled a lot with uh, contamination, both in the laboratory and the field. 
And in the laboratory, the problem is, is we deal with so many sediments and uh, there's diatoms floating in the air. And so in the beginning, we were finding uh, modern diatoms and even the older material. So we really had to work to clean up our act and uh, to make sure that we weren't contaminating things ourselves in the laboratories. Um, but the other problem is, is that you can also have contamination in the field. Uh, there was material we had that had soft material on the outside and that had modern diatoms on it essentially. And the, the rock itself had nothing else in it. So you can contaminate things on how you collect them in the field and bring them in um, as well. And the other important one is age control issues. I know we've gotten much better at age control compared to age control in the past. I mean, we have these tools like uh, carbon-14 or other methods to date sediments, uh, but it, it certainly has been a problem. And probably the most interesting one for us, we were looking at cores from the deep sea drilling project and they were supposedly in, um, in much older sediments and a very early Cretaceous time period, like 140 million years ago. And it had diatoms from the Cenozoic in these samples. And the problem was, is it was the, during the drilling process, they were bringing stuff downwards. And it wasn't until we read in the deep sea drilling reports that we found out that uh, they were of the wrong age. And I, I think this is uh, extremely important. If you start to look at the literature of diatoms from the past, uh, many of the dates are being constantly uh, changed uh, as our knowledge changes. So in terms of evolution of diatoms, I think one of the gold standards is when did diatoms evolve using these so-called molecular clocks. And I think that they provide lots of guidance, but I know they also have some problems associated with them. Um, I'm showing one from Nakov, uh, but I know that there were a lot of early ones from some of the diatom greats like Pat Sims, and there's uh, a variety of others from Linda Medlim and uh, Ed Terrio and yeah, other diatomist. And, but it, I'm using, using this one uh, because it is using a variety of different genes. I think there's 10 different genes. There's two RNA genes, seven plastid genes and two mitochondrial genes to, and this is only one third the entire profile that they have. Um, but essentially, you can see, if you look at 125 uh, million years ago, where we found the last diatoms, there are still diatoms that should be found in the geologic record, and we're not finding them at all. And so there's lots of reasons why that could happen. And so we're really puzzled about this gap in the fossil record. Uh, the diatoms from the aptium, from these two references, uh, both of them uh, have centric symmetry. It doesn't mean that they're monophyletic, uh, but it, it means that they all uh, have the same general uh, yeah, characteristics. So why do we have this lack of diatoms in the geological record? And I think one of the problems is most of the sediments in the ocean have been subducted. With plate tectonics, uh, it's really clear that big pieces of the continents are moving around and the ocean is brought underneath the continents. And so we've lost a lot of it due to subduction. Um, but it's also really strongly uh, influenced by post-depositional uh, silica diagenesis things like temperature and pressure. So when diatoms get buried at, at depth, uh, they dissolve. And it's because of temperature increases and pressure. But there could also be other changes. 
uh, things like lithology, um, things like um, clays help preserve diatoms, but pH, if it gets high enough, helps dissolve it. A pore water elemental composition can also affect silica diagenesis. If you have uh, aluminum, it can be incorporated into diatoms, but it also can be used to make new clay minerals. So there's lots of different processes that, that could happen through geologic time. Uh, two other aspects are that um, the earth temperature was warmer during the time period that, that diatoms evolved. And warmer means higher dissolution rates. And then it's possible that the early diatoms just occupied narrow niches. And so there's a very patchy distribution. So it's really difficult to find diatoms in the geologic record. Um, but so where should we look for diatoms in the future in the geological record? And I'm hoping this will inspire other people to do this, but the two places that we have found the best luck is one from a sediment formation in the Arctic on Devon Island uh, that was found by David Harwood. And uh, it has abundant diatoms uh, from, from 85 million years ago to 95 uh, million years ago. And then also the diatoms that I talked about from 125 million years ago come from a drill core on the continent of, of Australia. And so, um, so where should you look for them? Places where material has been uplifted from the oceans uh, and they're currently on the continents. Uh, when it gets buried, it can, it's too easy to dissolve <clears throat> and it could also be subducted. So there's gotta be, I believe there's gotta be other places on the globe where you have these materials where there's diatoms. So the next part of my talk I'm gonna address is how uh, dissolved silicate has changed through geologic time. And how does that jive with the fossil record? So um, we don't use diatoms for this because uh, it takes so many diatoms to collect to make a silica uh, isotope measurement. Um, it also doesn't fractionate as well. And so we use sponges and sponge spicules. And so on the left is this a uh, gorgeous plot or uh, figure or uh, picture of sponges uh, from tropical marine areas in, a sh in shallow water. And on the right is what we get when we take sediments and we clean them. And you get this whole mess of different things. There's really lots of sponge spicules in here, but there's also uh, radiolarians as well. And um, I think in this sample, I don't see any diatoms. But um, how, how do we get the silica out? So the first thing we do, and for those who have worked on sediments, it's a really long process. Um, we first digest them in the hydrochloric acid to get rid of carbonates. We then use nitric acid and or peroxide. Um, in some of these older sediments, the organic matter is really resistant that on some samples, we have to continue to digest for a period of three weeks in order to get rid of the, uh, the organic matter. And then we float out the silicious material with something called sodium polytungstate. It uh, has a specific density that you can regulate. So we make it closer to diatoms and so that we can actually float them out and then take off the surface of the water. Um, and then we have to go to the microscope and, uh, and pick out spun spicules, which is a very uh, tedious process. And then we digest them in sodium hydroxide. We clean them using column chromatography. Uh, and all this takes place in a clean lab, so we're not going to uh, contaminate them. And then we analyze them on a mass spectrometer, a multi-collector ICP mass spectrometer. 
and there's not so many of them in the world. I don't have one of them. And so we have wait times before we can measure the isotopes. And the other thing is on a good day, you can measure 10 samples. So it's a very tedious process to get to get the data, but uh, important. So uh, these are two plots about how we're using uh, dissolved silicate, uh, estimating dissolved silicate concentrations. So the plot on the left is a plot of the isotopic content of spun spicules. And you can see it has this curvilinear feature. And as dissolved silicate concentrations get really low, they're unable to uh, discriminate between the lighter and heavier isotopes. And as there's more silicate in the water, they take up the lighter silicates uh, and leave the heavy silica behind. And so this gives an indication of what the dissolved silicate concentration has been through geologic time. So for you diatomist, it's like a transfer function. It's the same sort of thing we're using this from. Um, this is from one of the earlier ones by Hendry and, and Robertson. Uh, there's more uh, recent ones. Uh, they look more complicated, but it also depends on what kind of sponges we're using. We're trying to be very careful and only use the uh, megasclerals, these ones that are between 50 and 200 microns long and have points at both end and are, and are round. And so we have used this in the past to measure, uh, estimate dissolved silicate in the oceans. And the blue and the figure on the right is from the Western North Atlantic. And on the, uh, uh, the red is from the equatorial uh, Pacific. And there are a couple interesting things about this. And uh, one of them, this is probably very much related to, it because these are sponges that are at the bottom water. So they're bottom water concentrations. And, uh, and you can see that in, uh, in the earlier part of the geological record, there were less dissolved silicate in the bottom waters compared to, to present. And it probably has to do with how bottom water is formed and how the ocean circulates at these two different sites. The interesting thing about the red one from the equatorial Pacific, um, they were actually relatively low dissolved concentrations to some time around 35 million years ago. And that's when the circum uh, Antarctic uh, polar current opened up we had circulation that went around the entire globe. And, uh, and you had a change in deep water formation from deep water forming in the North Atlantic to deep water forming in the Southern Ocean. And thus you have higher dissolved silicate concentrations. And so we decided to go back through geologic time and look for sponge spicules in the record and try and make estimates of what the dissolved silicate concentrations could have been through geologic time. Um, and I say it our, was our initial goal because we have the same problem as diatoms. There's few <laughs> diatoms in the, in the uh, geologic record, and there's few spun spicules as well. <clears throat> And one of the problems we have with the sponge spicules is diagenesis. And one thing that could happen, and it's a classic pathway for biological silica, um, for sponges, for example, is it goes from opal A, which is normal hydrated biogenic silica, to something called opal CT, which is a crystabolite and thymidite. And, uh, and and then it eventually can be diagenetically altered to quartz. And the process of this 
is it's both a dissolution reaction and a re-precipitation reaction, going from a disordered mineral to a highly ordered mineral. And what happens when you do that is it resets the isotope signature. And so what we need is to find opal A, and that has been really hard to find, is once you start to have diagenetic processes occurring, even though you can have diatoms that look relatively normal, they still have been recrystallized in the uh, isotope signature changed, and the same with spun spicules. And at least our experience so far is that biological opal A, these things, diatoms, spun spicules, and radiolarians, is rare in the geologic record. We have found nothing older than 120 million years old that's actually made of opal A that most of the material has been transformed. So we've been looking for spun spicules uh, through uh, the Mesozoic time period, and almost all the spun spicules have been altered to quartz, and quartz has changed its isotope signature. So we really can't use them for what we have intended to. And so if we look at this record, um, the top blue line is what Siever hypothesized. I published a paper in 2017 where I also talked about uh, the evolution of silica transporters and the abundance of other silicifiers and that and suggested that perhaps diatoms uh, our dissolved silicate concentration in the, in the ocean were decreased much further uh, than what Siever had suggested. And the other question or hypothesis that I had was when diatoms evolved, they became extremely successful. And when they, because they're so good at competing for nutrients, and when they became successful in a very short period of time, they removed all the dissolved silicate from the ocean. And, and that's why it takes this big dive. And you can see the stars here. They're all the isotope evidence that we have. A uh, number of these are unpublished, so I'm not putting the real numbers there. I'm putting stars. But basically, all the concentrations that we have found uh, over the last 100 million years are low concentrations. So something uh, between, yeah, as low as, as two micromolar to, uh, to up to 80 micromolar. And, uh, it, and it's really disappointing because we can't, we don't have ones that go uh, back in the past um, because we can't find opal A in the geologic record. But at least it tells us for the last 100 million years that the diatoms have taken out almost all the silica out of the ocean, at least in surface waters. Um, there were three other studies that came out recently. Um, I'll talk about the Yi et al. first. And uh, that was based only on charts and looking at uh, charts to, um, precipitating out of the oceans. And, uh, and, and uh, they estimated that concentrations were also around 500 micromolar. Um, and there are two other papers, one from a Trower and one from Bull, and they were using uh, radiolarians. Uh, the Bull was using radiolarians uh, off of uh, the coast of Japan and um, and basically these layered sediments that had different bands of opal in there. And um, Trower was using uh, also radiolarian samples from uh, from carbonate sediments. And one of the interesting things is they came up with really low estimates for what dissolved silicate concentrations were. But again, I think 
that both of these are examples of radiolarians that have uh, been dissolved and reprecipitated. And for example, when you look at these radiolarians, they're they're solid. So and usually they just have a, a cell wall. So silica has filled in to those different uh, inside the radiolarians and probably has fractionated silica in it. So at least my um, feeling or my scientific, best scientific uh, estimate is that these are, are not really representing the same dissolved silicate concentrations than when they were laid down. So the last thing I'm going to talk briefly about is silica cycling and bio silicification in the oceans through geologic time. And it's amazing that sits have been around for about 800 million years, and they're common in a whole variety of different organisms. You can even find them in, in forums, and there are some forums that require silica in order to divide. Um, uh, there are, of course, in, in land plants and radiolarians uh, and diatoms and chrysophytes and a variety of other organisms as well. Um, and the amazing thing is they also occur in Senecococcus, <clears throat> which is a small, um, very <clears throat> small uh, algae, uh, less than one micron, and it's the most abundant algae in the ocean today and probably in the past as well and they also take up silica and it was really interesting when this was published in 2012 no one believed it i mean why do cyanobacteria uh, take up silica uh, you can understand why diatoms might but why do these uh, take it up and it's even been more confusing over the last decade because there's some of them that have silica transporters and some of them that don't have silica transporters and both of them can take up silica or not take up silica. So why they're taking up silica or why they're not is really a puzzle for us today. Uh, but th there's actually uh, been a number of papers published. We are publishing a paper now that's coming out in environmental uh, microbiology reports, and it's that pico-eukaryotes um, can also take up silica. It's from work we've been doing on the Baltic Sea and, and adding silica and actually seeing accumulation in these different organisms as well. So it's not just diatoms and radiolarians and sponges, but there are a variety of other organisms that can take up silica in the oceans. The question is, is are their abundance big enough and are they able to bring it to the sediments where it can be stored? Uh, there's also been changes through geologic time with different uh, sponge reefs uh, along the continental shelves. And uh, this paper by Kate Ritterbush uh, describes these uh, sponge reefs that occur. And she's made some calculations suggesting that they could be major places where silica is removed from the, dissolved silicate is removed from the water column and deposited in, in sediments as well. Uh, but there are other things that could happen with geology. Uh, continent to continent interactions produce intense chemical weathering that tends to put a lot of dissolved uh, and particulate materials into the oceans uh, and can increase the dissolved silicate concentrations. The other important thing are these large igneous provinces that form uh, that can also through hydrothermal alteration and the high temperatures put a lot of uh, dissolved silicate into the environment. And then we have the impact of evolution of rooted vascular plants that are able to send enzymes down deeper in soils and mine the upper soils of different nutrients 
which would also uh, release dissolved silicate to the environment if the plant wasn't taking it up. But there's all these things that can happen as well. Um, so I think it's amazing in one way that over the last 100 million years, it's been primarily the diatoms that have been important. We've had a variety of these things occurring. Uh, you have the uh, KPG event where the meteorite hit the earth and the oceans weren't functioning for some period of time and lots of materials went in the oceans. And it really didn't, from what we can see from our, our record so far, it hasn't really greatly increased the dissolved silicate concentrations in the oceans. So we had these two hypotheses and one of them is that changes in dissolved silicate inputs through orogeny, these different geological processes have caused changes in oceanic dissolved silicate concentrations. But really, it's diatom biomineralization that at least has control it over the last 100 million years. Even though we've had uh, the uplift of the Himalayas and a variety of other things, it really hasn't had a huge impact on the dissolved silicate concentrations of the oceans over the last 100 million years. So what we have tried to do in these projects, we're trying to interweave geology and biology to create new knowledge and interaction between biosilicification and organisms. And that's primarily from the Voluntary Grant. We're doing work on the Edicarian Cambrian transition now, but I, I haven't enough data to present here. And the other thing is, is the second project, the impact of diatom evolution on the oceans is still ongoing. We still have several years left in this particular project. And I'm still very curious how these interactions have evolved uh, Earth's history. So just to end, I wanna give uh, special thanks to people at Lynn University and my group, both past and present. There's a whole list of people on there. Many of them are postdocs or PhD students. And then there's a variety of other um, collaborators that I've had that have played important roles in this work as well. So with that, um, thank you very much for listening. Hey, Dan, thank you very much. Um, you've definitely opened my eyes to what I feel like is a whole other discipline um, to uh, uh, coming from the biological world. And um, I, I, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to uh, drop them in the chat or raise your hand um, and, and you can ask Dan yourself. Um, I have a very naive question for you, Dan. Like say, I have a full stack of authors and papers now to go check into thanks to your talk. Um, so if I get together with my geological family and we find some marine uplifts um, in the continent, what's the best way for me to go approach them? Do I need to go find these sedimentary layer, layers and bang on them with my rock hammer? And, uh, well, if they know the uh, older ocean sediments that are on the continents, then it would be best to uh, organize a, 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 some people to go and look at them, you know, <laughs> to go and to take samples. It's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think you should bring your rock hammer with you. It, <laughs> it, many of these uh, formations aren't so lithified. So okay. it's, it's not like uh, breaking rocks open to get them. Is that we're hoping if they're lithified, the chances of them finding opal A in there are much less. Sure. Okay, um, we have a couple questions in the chat. Sarah has her hand up. Go ahead, Sarah. I think Matt was first, so. Oh, oh I only saw one hand up, sorry. Um, okay, Matt. Go, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> um, Dan, you had a, a slide um, showing the first sponge fossils at about 550 million years ago. Right. Oh, I mean, how did those survive? How did that silica survive that kind of age? Or or is it, with, what's going on with that? So it, it had to be transformed to, to quartz. Oh, okay. 
but they but they can still, still look see like it in that form that it even yeah before it's, it yeah. looks like a a spicule yeah um i must admit that i don't know what they look like i've seen pictures of them but they're small things and yeah i wish i could help but i i really don't know i know they find them in the geologic record and uh and but you know the early sponges and early radiolarians uh they the modern things look different today mm -hmm. than what they they look like in the past i mean there's resemblance but uh they've undergone lots of transformations into what they are today okay thanks thanks for a great talk you're welcome okay matt jump in there all right um first yeah really great talk daniel really interesting um and to get on uh actually your your you mentioned about the uh changes in morphology in the sponge spicules yeah. um so the obviously that's uh, been a big issue with sort of putting together uh, the modern diatom fossil with the modern diatom flora with the fossil diatom flora um in in terms of thinking about evolutionary history um i mean some of the some of the genera between fossil and modern taxa i mean they just they look nothing alike right and so trying to piece those together has certainly been certainly been an issue um so this this broca um uh, manuscript that you mentioned that's in prep yeah. is it going to be illustrated is it going to be illustrated and um are there going to be source information about where where we could possibly find these taxa and maybe get them under the sem absolutely so Great. it's going to be uh so carolina has been working with andy Averson as well and so she's combining uh sits with diatoms and so uh her first paper should be coming out very soon uh, we had uh, minor revisions and it has been resubmitted but it's mainly about the lack of fossils from the past and the rough story and uh, the other ways of looking for for diet to make sure to ensure that they're diatoms um but her third paper, we think will be out and probably are submitted in probably three months. And in it, it'll have tables of the when the diatoms, where they are, and yeah, and species names and things like that. So it, the next step will be to put it into uh, a format where it can be used, like the, the diatom database is for the other fossil material. And uh, and as you know, the fossil material probably will need to be verified. Um, people call things a lot of different things. and uh, right. But I, I think just putting it all together in one place and having at least proposed names on them and, uh, it, and references on where you can go, because it's mainly the original references that will have the pictures. So it, it will take us a long way by having that database. Absolutely, but it'll be a great help. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if I could slip in and ask one more quick question, uh, if, if thanks, sorry, to, I don't want to dominate time here, but in terms of looking for some of these early, early diatoms, um, I was wondering if, if you're looking at girdle elements as well, like the, the scales that you see in some of these early diverging diatoms, the proboscia, the rhizoselenioids, some of these really long cylindrical diatoms that genetically appear to be um, very early diverging and, you know, have uh, the, the scales dominate, the scale girdle elements dominate the, uh, the biomass rather than, rather than the valves themselves. Um, because if, you know, or the sister group to diatoms, the parmales have these scale-like silicious elements, then, you know, parsimoniously, it might it might make sense that scales sort of dominate before you get to to circular valves. Yeah, I, I yeah. So the 
I'm not the one that does the diatom. It's it's <laughs> Carolina. You know, my expertise is taking the diatoms and dissolving them and looking at the elements that they came from. And so uh, it's Carolina that does all the diatom work in our group. But you should feel welcome to contact her directly if you just look up her name on the web in Lynn University. And uh, I'm sure she would have a conversation with you and tell you about what we're doing. All right. Thank you. Sounds like another interesting conversation to have. Um, we have a uh, question from Tom Frankovich. He says, um, are there, um, let's see, what's the best way to, oh, OK. Um, what modern day environments, though rich in diatoms, do not preserve uh, well in sediments? Um, are there modern day communities that are absent of, of diatoms in the sediment record? Absolutely. There's lots of those, really lots of those. And uh, and I, I guess there are a couple of things. Is one is uh, is resuspension. So coastal environments are really poor. Uh, for having diatoms in the sediments, they tend to be fewer and they dissolve. Um, there are, it, it's really amazing if you look at, for example, figures of the Southern Ocean and you look at where uh, diatoms are growing and then you look at where you find biogenic silica in the sediments. And there tends to be hot spots where you have more accumulation. And uh, it has a lot to do with other materials that are coming in and what the sedimentation rates are. If the sedimentation rates are too slow, uh, you won't have a, a fast enough accumulation. And, uh, and so it'll leave diatoms at the sediment surface longer to dissolve. And, and so there, there are a whole variety of environments that are, are bad for diatom preservations, much more than there are in, in lakes. Great, great answer, thank you. Um, here's a question from Jan, and um, kind of on the note of variability. Um, is there a lot of spatial variation in the silica concentration around the oceans based on top and bottom depth, currents, or embayments? Yes. So I mean the if you look at the uh, the equatorial regions, except for the upwelling in the Pacific, for example, uh, that most of the oceans are com nearly completely depleted of dissolved silicate. I mean they have very low concentrations. They have low concentrations of everything, uh, but you know deep water forms in the Atlantic and then moves down. Uh, and and enters into the circum anarchic polar current and as the water gets older you have more nutrients that are in there so there are some correlations between age of the water uh, age of the bottom water and uh and dissolved silicate concentrations when it reaches the pacific it, it's relatively high, it's 150 micromolar, um, but that's still a factor of 10 less than saturation. And uh, in the open oceans, yeah, it could be almost detectable, undetectable as well. But you have these big, broad areas of the oceans without silica. And as you're closer to the continents, there's more. Sure. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and, and if you still have time for a few more questions, uh, we, we have a few to ask. Yeah. And if people need to go, they can always catch up, follow up on the recording to hear their answers. Um, so uh, an, uh, another question that Jan asked right away was, um, did the diatom drawdown of silica affect the diversity and abundance of radiolarians and sponges? Ooh, um, I, I would say yes, but uh, uh, but sponges are more resilient because they're at the bottom and bottom water concentrations tend to be higher. Uh, radiolarians can ra range between the surface layer and a thousand meters. And you know, once you get below the photic zone, dissolved silicate concentrations are higher. Uh, 
because you don't have diatom growth. And uh, and so those two are argue against it being that much different. But if you remove so much silica from the water column, if it really was uh, 1,500 micromolar or even 500 micromolar, it would um, it would have a big impact on all the organisms. Great. Um, and I have uh, another question from Layla, um, very much again, uh, kind of an interest uh, or piquing my interest. Um, um, she talks about how um, you spoke about the Arctic and the Australian uplift structures that might contain um, old diatoms. Um, I guess she's again, just inquiring about like what kind of sediments are these or where, where might these formations be? Um, um, yeah, so uh, there are sediments in the Weddell Sea. It, it's a huge area. It's probably bigger than the continental United States. <laughs> uh in it there is a, a ridge there and uh that's where they found that's where the diatoms come from from 120 million years ago and uh and one of the reasons that they're there is they talk about they were never buried so there sure. was a lot uh, accumulating and then for some reason they stopped accumulating uh and it was a real problem recovering the cores in that area. So I think they only ended up with like one meter of core that was usable. You know, these cores are, you know, 10, 20 meters long or something like that. I don't know. They're huge. And, uh, and, and so, it, yeah, they were close to the surface of the sediments. So, again, burial is a bad thing. But there, there's also samples that we have now from the Arctic uh, uh, that was published by uh, some uh, diatomists. And, um, and from the deep ocean, uh, it's about 1,500 meters. Uh, but there are also diatoms that are at the surface, and they're about a... a a hundred million years old too, or eighty between eighty and a hundred million years, and so they just haven't been buried by other processes. So, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, really appreciated your talk. It was almost a, a breath of fresh air, being a, a, a different topic, and again, getting me to think about um, you know global cycles and and the roles that diatoms might be playing. Um, really appreciate it, Dan. Um, Thanks again for coming out today and talking to the Diatom Web Academy. Um, if there's anything else you'd like to, to, to say, you're, you're on your soapbox now and you can spread the word. Um, otherwise, we really appreciate you having to, you today. Um, I'll edit out that little technical difficulty at the beginning and we'll get your talk up on YouTube soon and we'll let you know. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here. And uh, I think one of the important things is to have different viewpoints on looking at the evolution of diatoms. I mean, the molecular stuff has really changed some of our pictures of how things, uh, uh, processes occur. But also, I think that having different people look for diatoms, and uh, I, I don't think there's enough uh, diatomists that are looking at the older material. And it, it would be nice to, to see more people doing that. Yeah, sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dan, and thank you, Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone. Us again in two weeks. See you then. So, Sarah, could you hold on for a second? Sure.